So if you just have this simple array of sites at your fingertips, whenever the media says something about it, you can actually check the temperatures yourself. You can check the sea surface temperatures yourself. You can go into these data sets and look for your own information and just compare what they say in the news and then go, no, 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 wait a second, I got a whole different data set here that says the complete opposite of what you just said. ADAPT 2030 Mini Ice Age Conversations covers changes in our climate due to a new and intensifying grand solar minimum. In the media, overlooking, downplaying, or burying cold weather changes occurring on our planet. This is in order to keep the global warming agenda steaming full speed ahead. I do this podcast and radio program because we need to begin conversations on how to adapt our food growing strategies long before 2030 as agricultural zones shift, affecting global crop output. But very few mainstream media outlets are talking about the most important issue of our time, cold weather crop losses. Our sun is going through a 400-year cycle, which has effects on our weather patterns as our magnetosphere weakens and the jet streams go out of flow. It's not CO2. It's not you. It's the sun. Are you ready to thrive in the grand solar minimum? Then join me for many Ice Age Conversations. I'm your host, David Dubine. This is where it gets interesting. This is what's bringing the heat. You can easily see where jet streams are pulling up from Africa, where other streams are pulling down or circulating in the Arctic. And when you look at it, the news doesn't make sense because they're saying the blocking high over England is causing the cold moisture over Iceland, the gloomiest in 100 years, the coldest in 100 years, the rainiest in 100 years. So what has happened? Why did that lock in place? because our jet streams are setting up differently, matching what's going on with the sun. This is what's happening. This is why our weather is so out of kilter right now. And if you are on this planet, you've seen extreme weather events sweeping our globe. It is now undeniable that these changes are very visible and they are intensifying. So again, I wanted to focus in on where are these record cold temperatures happening in the Siberian area that I showed you what those nine new cold temperature records set and Western Siberia being below normal temperatures. Well, if you just slightly turn the globe, you'll see that that airflow is coming directly from the northern part of Greenland and another circular flow directly at the North Pole, both pulling cold air down and sending it right over Siberia. Now, usually it's not like this. Usually that Arctic is locked in and usually circulates around itself in a big circle, if you will, maybe 80 degrees north latitude, but usually it has its own circular pattern up there, its own wind flow, everything's locked in. But it looks like it's broken off into several different sections at the moment. And see, this is the interesting thing. Now, instead of having one nice, even flow up there, now you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different flows that are all intermingling, bringing different air temperatures to different places instead of locking it in on its what used to be normal pattern. This is what happens when our magnetosphere gets weak. Now I want to bring you up to northern Aleutian area, Kamchatka Peninsula, Aleutian Islands. Massive, massive, massive low up there. So you can just expect these flows. And this is why I do believe that some of these temperatures, again, we want to go news media. They're telling you the Arctic temperatures are above normal temperature. But I'm saying even looking at just the simplest of temperature maps, it's not. That whole northern area of Russia and anything above Alaska and over above northern Canada to Greenland. So if you just have this simple array of sites at your fingertips – Whenever the media says something about it, you can actually check the temperatures yourself. You can check the sea surface temperatures yourself. You can go into these data sets and look for your own information and just compare what they say in the news and then go, no, 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 wait a second, I got a whole different data set here that says the complete opposite of what you just said. Ice core temperature data, when they try to tell you it's the warmest in this many years or that many years, they never really talk about the coldest. You'll have to do your own research on that. Basically, a history book will be your best friend. But when you go into the warming, 
there's all these different narratives and numbers that the media would throw out about it's the hottest for this many hundreds of years or the hottest for this duration of time. The ice core data is off of Greenland. The ice cores, that is the number one data set to reconstruct our climate. Now, for those of you who are just getting into this whole climate debate, okay, they call it a proxy, a P-R-O-X-Y, a proxy. It's a different me set of measurements that allows you to look back in time to reconstruct the temperature. Let's talk about a couple other data sets that you can use as proxies to determine different things about our climate, even thousands and thousands of years ago, beyond the historical records. Let's start with the second simplest one, tree rings. First, you can carbon date a tree so you know approximately when it died. So if there's some natural disaster, such imagine that volcano fuego that erupted and those trees were buried under ash. Okay, those trees died, they're gonna be entombed in there, and let's say 5,000 years, somebody digs up those trees they can still cut through them and look at the tree ring circumference and the width, and they can see how fast it grew, et cetera. So they would know if it was cooler or warmer, depending on how wide the tree rings are. And then secondly, they'd be able to date it. So they could get a good range. So let's say that tree was 120 years old, and they could date it back to uh, the year 800 AD. Then they could see exactly during that time, was the temperature warm or cooler? Now, that'll be one spot on the planet, but imagine if you could do that in multiple places. And there is entire studies devoted to this where they have something like 13, 14,000 different locations on the planet where they have found trees that have been buried in cataclysms, floods, mud, volcanic ash, lake bottoms, whatever. And they've been able to reconstruct the temperature in multiple locations based on all these tree rings that they found and then have dated the wood itself using carbon dating. And understanding that these seismic and volcanic events are cyclical and you'll want to check out Upheaval, why catastrophic earthquakes will soon strike the United States. Leading experts in the geophysical effects of climate change make a strong case for a link between the sun's cycles of behavior with highly destructive earthquakes. The authors explain that when the sun goes into reduced energy phase, a grand solar minimum as we're entering right now, it produces colder weather and the worst earthquakes across the historical timelines. Included are easy to understand charts and graphs showing that we face an imminent threat. Find out the status of the threat for California, Alaska, South Carolina, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and many other states and regions across our planet. And if you want to support this broadcast, click the link in the description box below to Upheaval Why Catastrophic Earthquakes Will Soon Strike the United States. Available in both paperback and Kindle versions. Another proxy where they can use stalactites. Now, you know when you go into a cave and those things that are hanging off the roof of the cave are called stalactites because they're holding tight to the top. And the stalagmites are the ones that are growing from the bottom as the water drops, drip, drip, drip from the top off the stalactites. Stalactites are very much like tree rings but on a much longer scale. This determines how much rainfall or drought condition there was over thousands of years. Now, cave systems, the water will seep through the tops of these when there's really heavy precipitation or rainy seasons, monsoons. Let's say it rained for 50, 60 years straight. They will get a very large you know, layer on that rock as it's crystallizing because there's minerals in the water and that's why there's stalactites up there. They're growing off the roof of the cave. Now, when they cut these open, it's the exact same thing. It's just like a tree ring. You can see the concentric circles in there. But you got to remember, it's not on a year time frame. These things are on like 50, 100 year circles on these. So they can get a really, really, really good correlation of where there was heavier rain at which periods in history across the planet by doing this in thousands of caves across the planet from the equator to you know Florida, to Europe, to Africa, to South America, Australia, and everywhere in between, they're able to get moisture reconstruction, and then they'll know how the intertropical convergence zone moved north or south by how much rainfall was there. Now here's the interesting thing. When they're looking back in these multi-century cycles of these stalactite rings, they can also see patterns of clearly 400-year cycles, clearly 200-year cycles, or there was more rain, less rain, 
more rain, less rain. The more rain was very pronounced, but it was discernible enough where they could actually see a zigzag seesaw pattern and plot it out on the amount of rain that was seeping through the cave uh, roofs. This matches up on the grand solar minimum time scale. So then they're like, well, maybe something has shifted. What causes the shift of the rains? Well, they understood that jet streams shift monsoon patterns. And jet streams are responsible for the intertropical convergence zone, which is right around the equator. That whole rain band moving up and down north and south moves hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles during grand solar minimums, creating droughts in some places and floods in others. During this transition period of approximately 10 to 15 years, this brings me up to the pollen count here and the uh, flood debris. Now, flood debris is a different thing. They can also tell how much rain there was by what kind of debris was washed into gullies and riverbeds and lakes. Now, they also find preceding these super wet events going in, they're finding huge debris flows. And then it stabilizes and then it comes back out. And then we repeat the cycle two or 400 years later. But they find entering into this, there's an enormous amount of flooding going on where there's larger you know, rocks and stones all deposited in layers. And again, when they dig into these layers, and this is called lake core drilling sediment, they usually use super high alpine lakes or lakes that are, have not really been disturbed in remote locations. They're looking for two things, pollen. So in warmer conditions, more plants grow, so there's more pollen. And that pollen that's blowing off the plants and trees settles in the water and it also creates microscopic layers of plant matter, pollen. And they can look at it in microscopes and actually see the layers just like tree rings or just like stalactite rings. So they'll drill into a lake and they'll pull up, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 feet deep of this. Even go down 100, they, I think they've gone down like 600 feet in some of these lakes. And they bring up the cores and then they analyze them for two things. The sediment that was up there, which would have been flood input, and also the amount of pollen. And a lot of times they, the pollen is so well preserved, they can even find what species of tree or what species of plant it had come from. So then you get in a whole subset of different information of thinking about, well, there were more pine trees at this time. Or there were, there were more deciduous trees at this time. Uh, there were more flowers at this time. There was more of this kind of temperate. Oh, there was less of this temperate. Well, this plant can't survive in cold, so it disappeared for 200 years in this place, and then it was back again. There's a good climatic record of how our plant species adapt to this ever-changing environment we live on planet Earth. Cold or hot, plants change with it. They change zones. The pollen also settles at the bottom of these lakes. And this is like the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth proxies you start to get into. So back to the drilling cores with the sediment in it. This is the thing that they're really starting to get very precise measurements of how much rainfall. And then they overlap the two data sets of the stalactites, how much precipitation came through a cave roof with on the surface of the planet, how much debris was washed in and the size of the debris. Larger rocks means much more ferocious water. Uh, lower water flow means just like gritty sand washes in. So then they start to overlay these sets of, all right, it was incredibly rainy in 1620. And then they find that on, this, on the lake surface, they can drill down and match the times up. And then they can start to take a look at which plants were moving with the pollen, as well as all of the uh, sediment that was washed in. So they're getting almost three data sets to correlate over a single dot area on our planet. But again, there's thousands of these areas that have been mapped globally. And then the ocean rafting. I don't, I've heard of ocean drift rafting. This is something that comes off of glaciers. And this is another proxy, which brings us into two more proxies where you can get temperature data. As glaciers break off in warmer periods, they carry with it debris. And when I mean debris, I'm talking about crushed rocks, etc. Now, some of these rocks are pretty big. Some of them are small, but whatever, it's trapped in the ice. And when the ice breaks off and forms an iceberg, as it's floating along, it's melting, and then it's dropping the sediment that was trapped in the ice. Again, they know when the warm periods or the cold periods were by mapping on the ocean bottom how much of, they call it, raft debris was deposited. And again, it's in layers. So you'll have a full 100-year layer. It was like nice-sized rocks, pretty good-sized gritty debris, and it makes a layer in the seabed. And then other times, it's just silt and sand, and that's it. And it undulates on multi-century cycles, and they can dig down and go millions of years back. 
And then they can start to put together, you know, ice melt, ice gain, ice loss, glacier loss, glacier gain, based on what was swept into the sea and what melted off and what dropped literally in the seabed. Now we're starting to get into some deeper kind of uh, data sets where you can really start to see that all these cycles are on multi-century, multi-millennia cycles. And at some points in there, you'll see it's just like playing a slot machine on seven slots. Ace of spades, 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 ace of spades. Ding, you win the money. Where they do find occasionally all of these data sets overlap into one cycle where they all happen at the same time. Usually they're spread out where this will happen for 200 years, but in majority of the other part of the northern hemisphere or southern hemisphere, it won't happen. And you'll, it'll be like a slot machine where you get different colors and different fruits it's set coming up in different places and you don't win the money. It's not an overlap of all the cycles all at the same time like you would win on a seven slot slot machine. That would, each slot would be a different proxy for the temperature reconstruction on our planet. Ice cores, tree rings, stalactites, pollen count, debris rafting, sediment. Trueleafmarket.com. I really want to talk about growing your own food, which will be a necessity moving forward. There's so many ways that we can go about growing different types of vegetables that we're going to need. You know, microgreens are incredibly nutritious. They're super fast to grow. In less than a week, you can have something that you can eat. Also, sprouts. We can get those a little bit taller, a little more dense, a little bit larger volume on the vegetation mass coming off of there. So how do you know what kind of sprouts to grow? How about wheatgrass or herbs? What about different types of herbs that we can add to our foods? Now, what I just described to you, there's a full range of starter guides there at trueleafmarket.com for you to take a look at. Even if it's just for your own knowledge and you don't purchase something from them, at least get the information so you know how to grow microgreens, you know how to grow sprouts, you understand what some of the herbs are for. Trueleafmarket.com. Use the link below and give yourself the gift of organic and heirloom seeds. But from my study so far, as well as others, they all believe we're coming right back into one of these times that everything's lining up. We are going into a multi-millennial event right now, and I just don't know why the media is not talking about it. This is my estimation firmly now, after I've done more research this last year and talked to a lot more people than I did in the previous year. We're going into a very substantial, very powerful cooling this time. It's not going to be a once in a 400 year event. That's too light. This is going to be, as was termed to me, it is going to be a much more heavier, powerful cycle. And I firmly believe that now. I was so set on the grand solar minimums, 200 years, 400 years. Then a few people are like, dude, you got to open your eyes wider because you're so set on this 400 year time frame. You're missing millennia of data. So I started to widen my scope. So my best estimation along with everybody else here. So here, as we go into these next few years, by the time we come to 2025, we will have gone back to something at around a 2000 year cold event. Now you can take that or leave it. It's the reason I sit down and prepare all these stories and kind of a, a dialogue of what I want to say each radio broadcast. Then I take this and then I put it in my podcast and occasionally I'll take the snippets and make videos out of them. All to bring in this information, which brings me back to the very first hour when I was talking about going out to the Matsu Islands. If we all work together, it's very easy. It's very doable, very survivable, very comfortable. We'll have plenty of abundance around us. New inventions, new technology, our lives will be actually better. I think they'll be simplified and I think we'll resonate at a different frequency just in terms of the way we deal with ourselves, deal with others. In terms of the healthy foods to put in your body, instead of having super long logistics chains, I think a lot of things are going to go more regional or even within the city, especially if we get vertical farms in disused shopping malls and disused like warehouses, factories, etc. If we come at it together, as was in the Matsu Islands, they even had you know extra, not vegetables, but they had extra fish, they had extra animals, everybody had enough protein, nobody starved, everybody lived pretty well, everybody had enough of what they needed. Because it was coordinated. The government had coordinated them to get ready for such changes. And it wasn't like one day they woke up and the government said, all right, you need to grow everything today. It was a preparation period. It took them approximately a year to a year and a half to get everything from start 
to move in, to get the supplies in there, to get people ready, to bring the tools in, to get people mentally ready, to get ready, to not have supplies for six months because they thought the Chinese were going to attack. It was coordinated. There was no panic. Everybody knew they would get through it. They shared. They traded. Money was a little different. It was more about your skills. The army had its own thing over there in different parts of the island. So even with the army, they would trade and, you know, be friends with the locals and there was protection. And it was all these things because everybody worked together. Now, I think we could get it into this same kind of mind frame globally. But first, the problem needs to be explained to people and not in a fashion that's going to spook them. I personally feel the media needs to start shifting into more of explaining about these jet streams going out of their normal flow and why. And that it's from the sun and that magnetosphere is going to weaken further and the jet streams are going to go more chaotic and more crazy. And the polar vortex will probably go down to South America. If the equatorial vortex is pushing clear up to Norway already, what do you think the southern or the polar vortex is going to do pushing south to the southern areas of the planet? That would be, in my estimation, the first best thing the news media could do to explain to people the changes going on. Not to focus on the food crop losses, not to focus on the population migration at the moment, but to explain the very basics. When the jet streams go out of flow, your temperatures change. You're going to get extreme storms, extreme floods. I'm also calling for a lot of insurance companies to no longer insure just like they're doing with the farmers now. The farmers can no longer get private insurance in the western part of the United States, specifically Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. They have to now get federal government insurance because the local insurers can no longer take the losses and they've cut everybody off. There's no more insurance for them farm-wise. They're starting to see some of the same tricklings down in Texas and also Alabama. Georgia, with the peach crop losses, they don't know if they're going to be able to, again, insure the uh, orchard growers this next year. These should be explained in a simplified way to people so we can come at solutions together. Just like they did in those islands, they came up with solutions during times of duress. Everybody worked together. There was no panic. This is the way we're going to need to come to it. Explain the problem so we can find the solutions. I'm saying 2019 is the rollover year that global warming officially dies. By the end of 2019 into 20. Well, your food prices are going to rise, too, and I think the cat will be out of the bag. And I think we're going to have a lot of problems economically next year because people are going to take their money out of the bank and start buying stuff, cashing in their stocks. I think perhaps it's one of the reasons that the media has been pushing everything's normal for so long is they don't want you to do that to keep the fractional reserve system up and floating. But to see how the economy is going to function as we progress forward just need the history book. And it happens every time. So once you know this and you understand that it is a part of what is occurring now and will intensify over the next few years, it's a done deal. You just say, all right, how are they going to fix it? How are they going to work through it to allow trade and commerce globally to continue? As central banks start to fall, as currencies devalue or hyperinflate, as population migration starts to ensue, as real estate prices decrease or actually go to zero value where areas will be uninhabitable due to the cold and the downing of grids and regular infrastructure on our planet. This is going to have a pretty big effect, I should say. Gargantuan would would probably be a better statement of how this is going to affect our economy. Some things are going to go to zero. Food prices are going to skyrocket. But we're going to have to come up with new innovative solutions to our food growing and agricultural system delivery as well. And that's why I call my channel Adapt 2030 on YouTube, because we will need to adapt. And if you can't adapt and if you can find the niche, you will definitely thrive during these coming changes. Yale coming out with new studies talking about cold and heat, verifying that, well, Volcanic eruptions are triggered by cosmic rays, and that's one of the main factors in the whole cooling scenario. Hope you get some information out of this so you can get yourself more prepared, share information with your friends and family, and start really thinking about the changes that are coming, are here now, and how they're going to intensify and affect all of our lives. 
including food production, which is the main thing I keep going back to, the crop losses that will ensue from this year. And it actually started last year. You start to look around the world and you see crop losses all over the place. Something switched, something swung completely in our jet stream patterns, and this would be explained by the magnetosphere weakening. As our sun descends into its 400-year slumber, termed a grand solar minimum. This video is brought to you by our friends at trueleafmarket.com. Heirloom and organic seeds for any grow zone on our planet. 